Hi, I recently got a request from someone who's interested in simulating a product from a material called Hytrel. And I was thinking, huh, that would be a good topic for me to talk about in one of these videos. So Hytrel is a material made from DuPont and it's a thermoplastic elastomer and has pretty good properties. It's been around for, for a number of years and a lot of people use it for different applications. So I thought, well, this is now uh, 2021. It's time to talk about what the best material models are available and how they can be used for high trail and similar thermoplastic elastomer type materials. Um, so if you go to the DuPont website, <clears throat> DuPont has pretty good data available for their different materials. So here's uh, one particular page to talk about high trail. It's used in many different applications. And um, if you scroll down on their website, they have some, some information that you can read about. The material that I have some data for is a very specific kind of high trail. It's uh, called 7246. And um, this is a material with a sure hardness of 72D. And uh, it's a lot of good information on the website here, data sheet materials like the modulus, the yield stress, and stress at different strain values, etc. And if you scroll the way down here on this page, uh, there are some, some graphs with different data sets uh, that one can use uh, to, to understand the properties of this material. For my the study here today, though, I, I used my own data, which is a little bit more detailed. It has both tension and compression, different strain rates, etc. So it's a little bit more powerful in terms of selecting and using advanced material models. Uh, so that's what I will use in my demonstration here. So the, specifically, the data that I have is shown here. Um, there is uniaxial tension, uniaxial compression, up to about 50% strain. Um, this is plotted in M calibration, which is what I use for these demonstrations. It's a very good software for quickly analyzing data and calibrating different material models. So I plotted true stress, true strain here. You can switch to the actual data that I have was actually an engineering stress strain, and that's what it looks like. This is the real data. But I, I'm, I often like to plot true stress, true strain, because when you plot it that way, you can better see the, the difference in some, this difference between tension and compression specifically. You can see the yield stress between tension and the yield stress between compression. So um, we'll see, what do we see here? We see that um, the yield stress is indeed slightly higher in compression, it looks like. So at about 25% strain, it's about 40 or something, and here it's about 30. So this is relatively common for for thermoplastic-like materials, or even these uh, type of materials that we're talking about here, they're a little softer, but they still have this asymmetry. So that's that's why I often recommend doing both tension and compression experiments. <clears throat> so what do I have? We have different tension and compression at different strain rates. I have one really fast tension test, but otherwise relatively slow tension and compression tests. It's interesting, when you plot things in M calibration, you see that there are five lines on the screen, it appears here, five uh, in the legend here, but on the load cases here, there are seven of them. The, the Poisson's ratio load case is deactivated, so six left. But I used a feature where I suppressed the, um, the entry in the legend for one of these load cases. There are two of them here, they have the same strain rate. So instead of having the same strain rate twice in the legend, I took perhaps this one, and if you go to miscellaneous, you can remove it or add it to the legend by selecting that checkbox. So that makes the legend a little easier. So this is the data that I have. It's not really an optimized data set for this material. I have another video and, and discussion about smart testing, uh, where I talk about what tests you really should do to get the most information with the least number of tests. This data set doesn't quite follow that. It doesn't have stress relaxation. There is no creep. There is no cyclic loading beyond the first unloading cycle. And um, there, is, there are some other things one could do with this data set to get more information using less specimens. But it's still, for our purposes, a reasonably good data set that, it, that is good enough to calibrate some, some really interesting material models uh, to this material. The one thing, though, that I want to mention is that I can't calibrate a Mullins damage effect model to this data, but it's looking at the data. I can see that because we have loading and unloading. And I can't really distinguish in this case what is um, damage versus viscoelastic behavior. And I have another video about that if you're interested in that specific topic. But that's kind of one of the uh, last limitations of this data set. So 
let's go ahead and examine different material models and see how they work. And so we can figure out what is the best material model to use to represent this kind of behavior. So I have already calibrated a few models here to help me out a little bit. Um, let me pick something very simple to start with. Uh, and that's an abacus linear viscoelastic material model. Doesn't matter if it's abacus or ANSYS or, or some other FE. So linear viscoelasticity in general is a terrible choice here um, because um, I'm going to minimize the size or reduce the size of this legend here. We'll see. Because this material actually undergoes permanent deformation, undergoes some plasticity. And as a rule of thumb, you should remember this, that when you're analyzing a polymer beyond the onset of plastic deformation, you should really never use linear viscoelasticity. The error is terribly large. It's not something you like to do. I wouldn't recommend it. I just added that because someone may say, well, why don't you use linear viscoelasticity? Well, the answer is that it doesn't work. It's not a good choice. How about something else? Well, there are really two other classes of material models one can use here. This is a pretty large strain. There's plasticity. There's all kinds of stuff. One can use a metal plasticity type material model, right? Or you can use one of the more advanced viscoplastic material models. They are more modern. So uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the plasticity-based material models. So I picked here an ANSYS meso plasticity model. Meso plasticity in ANSYS is a, a multilinear isotropic hardening plasticity model. It can match the data really well, as you can see, during monotonic loading. It doesn't uh, in this case, I didn't activate a rate dependence to it. But the problem, the main problem, I would say, is the unloading is strictly linear until you get the reverse plasticity far out here. Not what we see experimentally. It way overestimates the permanent set. The error is about 20%. Not a good choice, uh, really. You can activate a creep to this, and that doesn't really improve the predictions either. Um, but how about Johnson Cook? Johnson Cook is it's another plasticity model that's in most finite element codes. The Johnson Cook model is similar. It's an isotropic hardening plasticity model. It has really poor uh, predictions of the unloading response and cyclic response. Not a choice if that's what you're looking for in your FE simulations in the end. We do have a reasonably good strain rate dependence to, that you can activate. But again, error is about 17%, not particularly exciting, not what I would aim for. Um, the last plasticity model I will talk about is a uh, kinematic hardening type model. This is the abacus. It's called the combined hardening plasticity model. And it does better during unloading, as you can see. It rolls over. It recovers during unloading because it's a combined kinematic hardening plasticity framework. The error is still 17%, though. It's not something I would be very comfortable using in a finite element simulation. But it's available. Uh, but again, it, it's really not the modern choice. There are so many new material models that have been developed the last couple of years, number of years, that work so much better than this. But it's something people are aware of, so that's why I want to talk about it. Let's talk about the Abacus PRF model. The Abacus PRF model is a, at this point, not all that super new in Abacus. It's been around for a while. It's a multi-network framework. and. Um, I have some other uh, videos to talk about the PRF model. In this case, I use my favorite representation of the PRF model for this class of material. It's a three network representation with your hyperelasticity and power loss strain dependence of the viscoplastic flow. That usually works pretty well. In this case, the error is better than the plasticity models, as one would expect. It's down to 10%. The loading, the unloading, most aspects are, are reasonably well predicted. But it's a little bit clumsy in terms of the details of the predictions, right? It's, uh, the, it doesn't hit the things, the, the, the sweet spots, all that great uh, all over the curves. So if you, if you have to, you can certainly use this. It's better than any of the plasticity models. But it doesn't you know, make me feel super happy. And I, I wonder if there's something more accurate available. So there are two, two last models I want to mention here. One is the, the three network model. This is a polyumod version of the three network model. I click run once and it will show us that this is a different multi-network viscoplastic material model. It's non-linear viscoplastic and it has the error about 
percent. So it's actually quite much better than the PRF model in this case. There's some features of the specific model that makes it more accurate in general than the PRF models. Um, but it's, it's certainly a good choice. Uh, it looks like here the errors are, are reasonably small. It's a significant improvement over all the plasticity models that we talked about. The final model and the winner, actually, if you want to compare them in that way, is the polymod TNV model. The TNV model has the error dump to 5.7%, which is close to the repeatability you would have in experimental tests anyway. So if you do multiple tests at the same condition, you don't always get the same curve, obviously. There's some variability from test to test, and this accuracy that we see here, I typically think is similar to one with, what one would expect for repeatability like that. So it's an excellent choice. This is the most accurate model that I have uh, seen for high trail in general in this class of materials. It would be my recommended model if you're aiming for accurate predictions in the end. And uh, that's, that's how you would evaluate these kinds of things. Um, I have one more feature that I want to demonstrate here, and that's related to how is the errors really working in these material models. So this is a relatively new feature in uh, M calibration. So I'm going to pick the TMV model. I'm going to select um, the PRF model. So I select both of them under the calibrated models, and I click on the E icon there, experimental errors. And they create specialized plots for us. So if you look at the figure to the right, it's particularly interesting in this case, I think. It shows the error distribution function as a function of error. So what is this? Well, it tells us that the red curve is the TMV model. It says that um, the probability that this particular TMV model will give you an error that's less than 20% in a given prediction is close to 90%. So it's 90% likelihood you get an error that's less than 20%. So that's pretty good. The, T the PRF model uh, has about 60 or 70, 60, 70 percent or so uh, probability to uh, have the same error in the prediction. So there is a difference between the two models. You can plot it not only in the average error between two curves, but you can also look at the distribution of error for different uh, probabilities as shown here. So this is kind of an interesting way to evaluate models as well. Uh, so I just want to show you that. To wrap up, I want to show you this figure here. This is just a comparison of the average error between all of these models. Uh, see that the plasticity models are actually not all that great. The multi-network viscoplastic models are significantly better, and the TMV model from the polyma library has the lowest error in this case, which is not unusual for these types of materials. Um, anyway, I hope you found this useful. If you have any questions, just write them below.